Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. at some different facets of the Christian life, and last week we got started on the topic of uh, the Christian and freedom, so our, our freedom as Christians. First Peter chapter 2, let's uh, start reading here in verse 13, where the Bible says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brethren, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your word and for uh, the instruction that it gives us, the wisdom it, it doesn't just contain, but, but literally is. Now, God, may we gain from that, and may it become part of us, and help to guide and govern our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we were... We began looking, as I mentioned, uh, about freedom last week. Just going to review very quickly here um, the first few points that we, we got uh, through. I said, first of all, every man has the right to be free. I think it is within, within the heart of every man a desire for that very right. And uh, it, God puts many desires in our lives, uh, natural things that we we yearn for and want, and freedom is one of them. Now, Satan comes along and he offers counterfeits to those things for which God gives us a, a desire. God gives us a desire for salvation. We know, deep down, we know we need a Savior. Every culture has acknowledged this throughout all time. They've known there's a God to be reckoned with. There's, a, there's a, a something that he's not happy about and, and something that has to placate that desire of his for justice. And then Satan comes along and says, well, if you will sacrifice a human being, that will make him happy with you again. And that's only half true. It's not just any old human being that had to be sacrificed. It had to be Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, that had to be sacrificed. And that took care of God's justice and His demand for justice upon all humanity. And the first Adam messed everything up. And so the second Adam came along and, and restored uh, man's relationship with God. So, everything that God gives us or grants us or, or causes, he, he implants a desire into our lives, into our hearts. Satan comes along and, and tries to feed us a counterfeit uh, uh, satisfaction to that desire. Uh, God said it is not good for man to be alone. And so by, that, by making that statement, man has a desire to have somebody with him and to have a spouse, to have a wife. And so God caused Adam to sleep and he supplied that need. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So, so Adam had a need for, for a, a spouse. He saw Mr. Lion and Mrs. Lion and Mr. Zebra and Mrs. Zebra. And, and by the time he got done naming all the animals, he said, there's no Mrs. Adam. And, and God said, it's not good for him to be alone. I'm going to give him a wife. And so they put him to sleep. And you say, why did you say they? He said, let us. <laughs> and, and so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit um, put him to sleep, took one of his ribs right from his side, not below, not above, not out in front, not behind, but right next to him. And, and out of that rib formed Eve, brought her to him, presented her to him, and God instituted and created marriage and the family unit. First thing God instituted on this planet was the family. 
Uh, later on, he instituted government. Later on, he instituted the church. And so, uh, the high priority on the family. Now, Satan comes along and says, let me, let me alter that for you. You don't have to stay married. You don't have to get married to begin with. And it doesn't have to be with someone of the opposite sex. Uh, and so he counterfeits it uh, more and more and more and more until finally it gets so far away from, from God's original thing that it, is, it has nothing at all in common with it. Um, and, and don't think for a minute that he is done perverting the idea, the concept of marriage. He is not. There's more in the works where he would like to destroy that even further. Um, let, let me move on. Freedom. Uh, so I said, one, every man has the right to be free. Number two, uh, oh, I had reviewed number two. Freedom is not the right to do whatever we want. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. That's not freedom. As far as the Christian is concerned, that's not freedom. Number three, freedom is your right to do what you should do. It's not to do what you would or what you will, but what you should do. Freedom is, is the right to, uh, to do what you should do. Verse 16 says, as free and not using our liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. So I'm free. My hands are free so I can, I can punch somebody with them. No. Dad always said, You're, the freedom for you to swing your arms ends where my nose begins. And... Uh, so, and, and really, our freedom should be restricted uh, by something different than just our own will. Uh, so freedom is your right to do what you should do. Number four, since my freedom is the freedom to do what I should do, then there has to be some way to, to dictate that definition. Well, what, just who gets to say what I should do? Well, I can decide for myself. Somebody else can decide. Uh, or a group can decide for me, that's socialism, or I can just let God tell me what to do. And that's what the Christian, uh, the way the Christian ought to live. Uh, somebody asked a, a preacher, I was listening to a preacher today, and he, was, he said he was on an airplane, and uh, the guy next to him just kept, he said, oh, uh, because the preacher got out of his Bible and started reading it, and the guy said, oh, uh, you're a religious fellow. He said, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and I'm a preacher. And he said, oh, let me ask you some questions. And he'd ask him one question. The guy said, well, the Bible says this. And he asked him another question. And what, what do you think about this? He said, well, in the Bible over here, uh, this chapter and verse, it says this. And, and every question it, it kept coming back to the Bible. And here's what the fellow finally said. He said, have you ever thought for yourself? Because every answer he was given was not his own opinion about something. He said, what do you think about this? He said, well, this is what the Bible has to say. Have you ever thought for yourself? He said, yeah, back in the 60s. <laughs> and, and you know what? God set him free from that. God set him free from that. Uh, and, and, you know, I have found that when I think for myself, I am so much more likely to be wrong. Then when I just go to the Bible and find out what it says, instead of trying to figure something out from the ground up, all I need to do is find what has already been said and what has already been determined. I don't need to figure out how to baptize. I just have to look to the Bible and find out how they did it in the Bible, and there we go. I don't have to reinvent the thing. And, and there's so much stress and, 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 and trouble in the world because people go in trying to... Uh, reinvent that they go to work and, and here's here's a person comes into a job they're making minimum wage and they're going to reinvent the whole store listen if you're smart enough to reinvent the whole store you're smart enough to start your own and be a multi-billionaire like the ceo that you are working for did uh until then he didn't hire you to reinvent the world he hired you to sweep the floor mop it and, and wipe down the tables and chairs. Uh, and, and so, uh, which, by the way, has become almost over, well, not almost, it has become overwhelming to some teenagers in the world today. Sweet, and, and Joyce laughing, uh, but this is not about your experience. I was talking to a guy who owns a, a, a small little fast food ice cream shop and had a teenage girl working in there. He said, do you want to do the dishes or do you want to do the lobby? She said, I'll do the lobby. 
what do I need to do? He said, you need to sweep the floor, you need to mop it, you need to, to wipe down the tables and chairs. And there might be eight tables, sets of tables and chairs in there, maybe. And he said, you've got 40 minutes within which to do it. And he got busy about doing something else, and, and he, looked, he said, uh, where's, and he called the girl's name, and they said, we don't know, and then she went to the back to get some mop water. And he said, well, she needs to sweep first, that's what we told her. So he heads to the back, her grandpa is bringing her back in. <laughs> said, she came out to the car crying. And he said, what are you crying about? He wants me to sweep the floor, mop the floor, wipe the tables and chairs, and only gave me 40 minutes to do it in. <laughs> and he said, sweetheart, this is the real world. Get back in. You're not going to run away from that. And, but that was just too overwhelming for her. And, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 anyways, um, freedom's being misused. I think of this idea, I uh, heard this preacher today, he said, uh, he said, does everybody in here play video games? He said, hold your thumbs up. And he said, you can tell the ones that, that, that live on video games because their thumbs are as big as round as their neck <laughs> from all the, the work they do with their thumbs and everything. Anyways, uh, I thought maybe he was going to look for calluses just on the thumbs and not the rest of the hand. Um, let's move on. Number six, anything else? Oh, no, no, number five. Now, so we did those four last week. Uh, number five, if I can keep, keep my place here. Number five, I keep wanting to get ahead of myself. Freedom. Freedom is my right to obey God. That's what freedom is. Freedom is my right to do what I should do. And I have a final authority on just what that is, what I should do. It's the King James Bible. My King James Bible is my final authority. And, and you know, that's one reason why I, I make an issue of the King James Bible. That's one reason why I will fight for the King James Bible. Because there has to be a final authority. And if you, if you don't use the King James Bible, then what you have is a and we don't know how many steps away from final authority it is because they get rewritten every two to three to four years. And so, well, this is, this is the, the latest and greatest. Is it the final? Well, until we quit making money on this one, and then we'll have to rewrite it because the language changes and slang changes and all that. And we have to keep up with the world. Uh, isn't that something? God was never, ever in the past worried about the world getting ahead of it. And him falling so far behind the world. That, that never happened. It, and, and so it, it concerns me when people are representing God or claiming to represent God and saying, poor thing, just can't keep up. It's a good thing he has our help. And we can come up with the, the, the new non-literal dead translation or what, and I think they're going to run out of names before they run out of translations. And pretty soon it'll just be about three letters, and then a, a hyphen, and then numbers after that. Um, and it's, it's, it's getting quite ridiculous. I have a final authority. And, and freedom is not to do what you choose, or to do what the government chooses for you to do. Freedom is to choose. Uh, freedom is my right to obey God. Number six. Anything else is taking away God's freedom. I understand everything we have, we have because God gave it to us. And we're just stewards of it. So when I talk about my freedom, even though I'm talking about it in, in the correct sense of the word of what freedom actually is, the only way and the only reason that freedom is mine is because God put it into my care. It actually belongs to God. And, and so anything else then, if I misuse that freedom or turn it into something else, then I have taken something that is God's property and, and taken it out from under His authority and I've, I've stolen. Um, if God's property is not protected, then He's lost that. It's been taken away from Him. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6.
First Corinthians chapter six. And verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, my spirit is God's, my body is God's. I have been bought with a price. Everything that I have belongs to God. Everything that I have belonged to God before I was ever bought with a price because God created it. God still owned it all. Then God purchased me. Now He owns me twice and owns everything that I have. He owns me and I'm not my own because I was bought with that price. If you're a child of God, you also have been bought with a price. And so when I decide to take freedom that God has put into my care, that God has given me, He's given me and really it doesn't belong to me. I'm a steward of that. He has, he has given me authority over that freedom. And when I decide to take that freedom and use it to do what I want, then I'm taking God's property away from Him. And God's property has as much right to be protected as our own. Read a, uh, just read a headline and a little bit of the article. The state attorney general in Missouri overruled the local prosecuting attorney on that couple that stood out on the front lawn defending their own property. That local prosecuting attorney was a George Soros funded person and the state attorney general said, uh, I will not stand by and have the law abused by anybody. And, and they had, uh, that local person had, had said, we're gonna press charges against them. And the state attorney general said, no, you're not. The governor had said, uh, he said, uh, uh, husband and wife, don't worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about the charges. Don't worry about anything else. If they find you guilty, I'll pardon you. Donald Trump, as president, said, don't worry about it. <laughs> I've got a pardon <laughs> over here. I'll sign for you. Uh, but they never should have had to face charges to begin with. And the state attorney general said, that's absolutely, absolutely true. Missouri has a little thing called the castle doctrine, which means you are allowed to protect your home, which is your castle. Uh, but just as much as they had the right to protect their property, God's property has a right to be protected also. And, and when I misuse his freedom, I am taking his property and putting it somewhere where it shouldn't be. Number seven, if you force me to obey God, you have taken away my freedom. If you force me to obey God, you have taken away my freedom. At one time, in our great country, at one time, Christians went ahead and took care of the poor. They took care of the needy. They, the, the orphanages were ministries of churches. Um, caring for the widows was the ministry of the church. Turn with me to James chapter 1. And here's, here's a passage I find very convicting. James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We're fine with that, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, but what about the fatherless? What about the, the widows? And I don't think that just means we should go and visit and knock on the door and say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, what do you think about this weather? And, and uh, how about that football team? I don't think that's what it's, what it's referring to in, in visiting them in their affliction. Okay, it's been nice talking to you. I must be on my way. I think it's, it's communicating to their affliction doing something about it, dealing with it. And Christians used to do that a lot more now. And, and as people lost character, as the country got away from being a Christian nation, 
and, and to the degree that it moved away from its Christianity, the government decided, we're going to take that over. And so instead of somebody saying, you know what, I'm going to give, I'm going to give to the church and in such a way that uh, the church will have enough to help the needs of the people around it, uh, they said, I'm, going to, I'm just going to keep that. Uh, I'm going to tie. That's my bare minimum. And so that's where I'll... And that's just supposed to be a starting point. Uh, but... Uh, and then so churches became less and less and less funded. The amount of help and things that they could do for those around them became less and less and less. The need didn't change. If anything, the need has gone up because the gospel was spread less and less. We... The church where I was saved was located in a very poor neighborhood. Now, when you have a poor neighborhood in a third world country, you have a poor neighborhood. If, if somebody in that, in that neighborhood, if they had a refrigerator, they were considered to be very fortunate and wealthy. And, and a refrigerator was more than just the place where you could make ice cubes and keep your milk a little bit longer than a few days. Um, a refrigerator meant you could have a business. You could make popsicles in that freezer and sell them out of the front window of your house. But most people didn't have enough money for a refrigerator. Nobody in that neighborhood had, had a TV set. I'm talking when people first started coming to church. None of them had any of these, uh, what we would call, that, that's, we don't consider a, a television a luxury item. Now we think luxury, that's, that's above and beyond a simple TV set, a little black and white tabletop set is definitely not a luxury, but they viewed it as such. Very, very poor area. A lot of the adults wouldn't come to church because they had been raised Catholic. They didn't want to change religion. That was a big thing. But they let their children come. Their children would come and get saved. We'd follow up in, in the household, and oftentimes then the mother would start coming, and she would get saved. And then uh, prayer meetings for uh, the dad, you know, the husband to come to church and, and hear the gospel. And, and little by little, families started coming to know Christ as Savior and get involved in the church. And you know, it's interesting, because little by little, they learned to be faithful with what God had give, given them, and they found out that somehow 90% went so much further than 100%. And, and before... We, before God moved us to another city, mo the households, where, where the whole household was a member of the church, they had TV sets, and they had some kitchen appliances, and, and their, their standard of living had been increased. Now, the church didn't give them food and give them money and give them things. The church gave them the gospel. The church gave them how to live their lives for God, and they gave them, it gave them a place where they could come and, and, and be built up and strengthened in their Christianity after they'd been saved, and a place where they could learn about God. And God began to bless them. You know, the best thing you can do for somebody is to give them the bread of life, the water of life. Jesus said, hey, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd be asking me for water. And the church used to care for the poor, the orphans, the widows. And it moved away from that because America lost its character. And America got away from being God-centered and God-focused. But the need didn't go away. And so the government stepped in and now forces so now the government forcefully takes your money, which you'll be hard-pressed to find anywhere in the Constitution where they were allowed to do that. Uh, but they're doing it anyways. And they forcefully take your money, and then they decide how to spend it. And they say, we're going we're gonna to run this orphanage over here. We're going to set up foster care systems. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and you no longer have any say. We're going we're gonna to put it in organizations that... that cannot have a Bible in them because it's government funded. And we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings over here who thinks their great-great-grandpa used to swing from a tree. And so we can't have a Bible in these, in these organizations, in these institutions. We'll, we'll take care of it. 
and that's socialist. That's that's forcing me to really do what I'm supposed to be doing as a Christian, anyways. And when I'm forced, that's not freedom. That's not freedom. Number eight, the government should rather protect my right to obey God, which which is true freedom. That's one of the things. One of the purposes of government is to protect my my freedom to obey God. The government should not be free from religion, but it should rather be a protector of my freedom of religion. And what is pure religion and undefiled? Well, it's to keep ourselves spotless from the world, is to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. City council shouldn't be passing laws blocking soul living. If they're going to pass a law, it should be a, a law that protects the exercise of the spread of, gospel, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It shouldn't be passing laws that interfere with, with churches congregating, but rather passing laws saying nobody has the right to interfere with that church congregating and opening the Bible and lifting their voices up to God in song. Some, some are like, like Pharaoh. Okay, Moses, you can take them, but don't go past that line. You keep them this side of that, that range of hills. And Moses said, no, we got to go out where God tells us to go. Well, you can go out this far, but, but only the men. Leave the women and children behind. And you can go out, you can do this, but we're going to... And, and here's the bottom line. It wasn't about distance. It wasn't about who... It was about who was dictating where they were going to go. And old Pharaoh needed to find out Pharaoh wasn't God. And Pharaoh kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing until he found out who God really is. And, and i tell you what, those that keep pushing and keep pushing against God find out who God is, whether they believe in Him or not. They, they will find out. They will find out. Now, better for them to find out while well, His grace and mercy are still available. And better for them to find out about that grace and mercy. And so they can exercise true Christian freedom to do what they ought to do. Now, what happens when government doesn't do its job? And they do pass a law saying, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. You can't tell others about Him. Well, our freedom... Our freedom doesn't come from the government. Our founding fathers recognized that. They said, well, there's some truths, and these are self-evident truths. We are given certain rights that nobody has the authority to place a lien on those rights. You look at that... That word has nothing to do with people coming from outer space. It's not inalienable. It's inalienable. You don't have a right to put a lien against my freedoms because my freedoms don't come from you. They come from my maker. And those freedoms are given to me so that I can do what he wants me to do. Not so I can do whatever I want to do. That's a misuse and that's that's theft. It's so I can do as it pleases Him. Remember, our whole purpose of being created, just as the whole purpose of everything that was created is, is for His pleasure. For His pleasure. Now, Him being a loving God, He'll give us joy and pleasure in living for Him. And that's the only place where it is truly found. Our true freedom, not that artificial stuff that leads you down a deep hole, but the real thing comes from God and should be used for Him. Let's stand tonight. We'll close with you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us and your desire for what's best for us. But as we leave here tonight, may we remember the true and proper use our freedom and its true origin. As such, may we always use it for you and that
that others may be led to Christ and see Him and know Him and accept Him as Savior. Lord, we ask it all in His name.